when we're talking about the numbers, what you're just looking at is the results of an interaction between a buyer and a seller. Originating from deep inside the Rocky Mountains, transported through the power of the internet, and arriving inside your tiny earbuds. It's the Appraiser Coach Podcast, helping appraisers increase their efficiency, quality, and make more money. Here's the guy who makes it his life's mission to create value for real estate appraisers nationwide. Your host and the Appraiser Coach, Dustin Harris. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the program. Dustin Harris hanging out once again on the uh, podcast treadmill today, trying to shed those pounds as we talk. I uh, can't wait to introduce you to my guests, but first want to pause and remind you that we're sponsored by a couple of great companies, All Mode being one. You can get a hold of All Mode at 800 All Mode, or of course, uh, go to their website, allamode.com. OREP Insurance is uh, my insurance, should be yours as well. Check them out by going to their website at orep.org. That's O R E P. Dot org. Well, I want to welcome to the program, Mr. Brent Bowen. Brent is the president of Texas Valuation Professionals. He's been in real estate, uh, in the in the professional side of real estate in North Texas since 1997. I got you beat by one year, buddy. Uh, he graduated from Baylor University with an enthusiasm for both economics and real estate, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Brent has written several articles featured in industry publications, has trained many appraisal professionals throughout his career. Uh, he has also authored a couple of appraisal courses. One of them we're going to talk about today. I want to welcome to the program, Mr. Brent Bowen. Welcome. Thanks, Dustin. I appreciate you uh, having me on the program and just look forward to our conversation. Likewise, I've seen your face and uh, heard your voice a few times out there in the uh, in the uh, small pond of appraisal throughout the nation and uh, love what you're saying. Um, and and just want to kind of dig right into it today and just talk a little bit about uh, your your theme. And I know you, you talk about a lot of different things, but the thing that turned me on to you was this thing called data science. Let's talk about what is data science and why is it important to the appraisal industry? Well, yeah. So data science is... Um... It's where all the discussions going. It's where so much of the technology is pointed, and um, and data science is great because we're we're finally able to um, have these mass quantities of information, and data science helps us to to sift through it and and use it. Um, so, sort of my mantra is data science is great, but it can be misused and it's incomplete without an understanding of the the social science that underpins it. Okay, I want to definitely dig into that. Let me uh, let me back up for just a second because you know about I don't know, maybe 4 or 5 years ago, uh, Brent, you probably remember this, you've been in the industry for a while. Um there was kind of a uh maybe I I wanted to use aggressive approach, maybe not aggressive, but just just rubbed appraisers the wrong way when you use the word data science or big data. It seemed like the enemy. Why, why do you think? Why do you think appraisers had that attitude a, a few years ago? And why do you think that's changed, or has it changed? Um, I well, honestly, I think some of that's the uh, collateral underwriter. Mm. Um, that was sort of, um, I think, the impression that a lot of us had um, was that okay, here's this. Uh, here's big data, and here's this uh, data science approach uh, through collateral underwriter, but you don't get to see it. Um, and I think that was off-putting. Okay, I'm going to be judged against something that I can't see, and you're not allowing me to understand how it's put together. Um, so I think that was sort of uh, starting off on the wrong foot mm. uh, for a lot of us. Uh, you, that I think that was that's when I started hearing that mantra of, of big data, big data, that was, <laughs> that was sort of uh, overused. Now I hate the term big data. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so let's, uh, um, let's try to put the whole history behind us and, and just, you know, like, let's, let's look at what data science really is and, and how to use it and how it, how it can be useful. 
Okay. Um, let's let well, let's look at that. First of all, I guess the you know play, playing devil's advocate here for just a little bit. You've got this thing called big data, data science, what have you. All this, all these numbers floating around, right? You and I have been doing this a long time. Uh, you know, almost thirty years we've been uh, we've been in this world. And I guess the question arises: well, What's wrong with the old school way, right? What's wrong with, for example, paired sales or uh, sensitivity analysis, right? Why not? Why not just stick with the, the tried and true, and I say that in quotations, right? Uh, uh, ways of of supporting our adjustments. Uh, well, I think that it's it's not an either or; it's a both and. Hmm. So um, those tried and true are useful but they have limitations. Um, data science, useful, it has limitations. And so when you uh, when you don't throw it all out and say, okay, now we're doing something new, uh, when we instead look at the new tools, look at the new techniques um, in conjunction with the tried and true, as you call it, um, uh, that will, will tell us uh, a little bit more information. It's perspective. It, it brings a much wider perspective. I want to get more into uh, you. You mentioned social science, for example, uh, in mm -hmm. just a little bit. But but first, I want to maybe delve into a little bit about um, what an appraisal is. Uh, and and I know that seems like a silly question because my listeners are appraisers, right? But I think sometimes even appraisers kind of miss the mark where we get so head in the trees that we forget that there's a forest there right uh and and and, and i guess my question brand is um what ultimately is the goal of an appraiser in other words you are given a problem the problem being value this home or value this property what in your mind is the appraiser's role there well, I mean, it kind of depends on your definition of market value. Um, if you're looking at sort of the, the standard definition, uh, we're making a prediction. Hmm. So what we're what we're trying to do is uh, take all of the information that's available and use that to help us to uh, to understand what the market looks like. And I, I like to think of things statistically sometimes. So um, if we're looking at the market in terms of a, a bell curve, you know, what's the most probable price? Well, that's the top of the bell curve. So if you're looking at it like that, well, then that goes into what, how does that really apply? What, uh, what does the market look like? How can you understand that conceptually? And I think that's where, where I sort of, uh, take take the detour into social science because you can't really understand the market until you understand people hmm. uh, so that that that's really what i think we do on some level if you want to break it down we make a prediction about the uh behavior of, of, of people in the context of real estate Love it. Want to dive into that in just a little bit. Uh, we're with Brent Bowen. He, of course, is uh, the president of Texas Evaluation Professionals. Uh, Brent, when we get back, I want to kind of talk about the marriage of the data side and the and the uh, human nature, as you will, the social science side. First, I want to pause and remind you that we're sponsored by a couple of great companies. Of course, Alamode being one of them. Uh, I talked a little bit today on the program about how long I've been in business. And uh, guess what? From the very beginning, folks, I've used Alamode. Now, that doesn't mean I haven't used others. Uh, out there, other software out there I have, uh, and they're great. They do some wonderful things. Um, and let's just speak bluntly for a second. You're going to pay a little bit more for all the mode. But here's the thing, folks, look at it as an investment, an investment in time, an investment in you, an investment in your business, uh, economies of scale, folks, to be able to do things right the first time to do them efficiently. That's what all the mode will help you with. If you're with any other company, I implore you to check them out. Call them 800 all the mode or jump on their website, look at some of their training videos and you'll see why I promote all the mode, all the mode.com or 800 all the mode. O rep is my ENO of choice folks. I know it's not something we think about a lot, obviously. Why would you think about ENO other than once a year when you renew, but folks, you really should. I actually think of ENO, not just because they sponsor this podcast, but because of the benefits that O rep gives me. For example, when I get ready to do my CE, my continuing ed, First thing I do is I pull up the OREP page and find out what is available for free, F-R-E-E. -E. Yes, they give us free CE every year. 
that can be counted toward your renewal. And it's great education. That's just one of the benefits. There are many with OREP insurance. Check them out by going to their website. That's OREP.org. Again, it's OREP.org. All right, folks, welcome back to the program. We're uh, with uh, Brent Bowen. Uh, Brent, welcome back. I appreciate you taking time, my friend. Thank you. It is a pleasure. I love talking about this stuff. Well, I, I can tell you've got a passion for it, and uh, I think uh, I think that's great. I, I think that sometimes this this merger, and maybe it's just me. This is my personal bias. Let me just be. Let me throw myself on the altar here a little bit. When we start to get into numbers and data science, I'll tell you what. My hardest class in college was statistics. Uh, I took it purposely in the summer so that I had no other classes and I got a tutor and I barely passed with like a C plus. <laughs> it just was not my thing. And here I am an appraiser. And I don't think that that's unusual, right? We think that, oh, we love real estate. We love people. We love, you know, this whole game of, of uh, you know, valuation. But but really, this boils down a lot to the data, to the statistics, to the numbers. Let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, you had mentioned the word social science. Merge those two for me. Okay, so when we're talking about the numbers, what you're just looking at is the results of an interaction between a buyer and a seller. And they're human, and they make mistakes. They do things that don't make sense. And um, I, I use the example of uh, my first home. Uh, my wife had decided that she her dream home had green shutters. <laughs> so lo and behold, I I get a message from her one day. Okay, I found our dream home. It's got green shutters. And guess what home was purchased? The home with green shutters. <laughs> and so you you can't um, you cannot boil all that down mathematically. Okay, mm -hmm. that that doesn't work. And that's where. Um, I I started to uh, to really uh, love looking into cognitive bias. So what I just told you there that that's cognitive bias, and so why do people do the things that they do that don't make sense? Um, and the the great thing about cognitive bias these just mental shortcuts that we make that that don't always make sense. We all do them. And we all make so many of the same mistakes, the same irrational <laughs> behavior. Um, and the nice thing about that is then we can recognize, okay, we're not machines. We, we don't think completely logically, but at least we're all human and we all are predictably illogical. Um, so, so being able to um, recognize those those elements helps us to to step back from the data and say, okay, what are we, what am I really looking at? Um, I, I want to to deconstruct this transaction and figure out why people did what they did. Well, it's helpful to to know from the beginning. Okay, I cannot know with one hundred percent certainty why these people did what they did. They don't even know why they did what they did because we don't we're not perfectly conscious of ourselves. Um, so, so we have to, uh, to recognize those limitations, those human uh, behavior limitations of data before we can start going in and saying, okay, the data says this. No, the data doesn't say anything. <laughs> the data is what it is. It's the appraiser who needs to interpret that data in light of how people actually behave. And so, so understanding their market is understanding how people are are behaving. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I say that all the time. The data says this. You're right. The data is the data. It's just it's just a fact. It's a number, right? Isn't it our job as appraisers to kind of interpret that data? It is. But I think what we do sometimes is we overestimate what we can know from a set of data. And that's and that goes to the, the major limitation of uh, data science is that there's a whole lot of um, push toward, okay, what's the 
best way to take a giant set of data and pull it apart and make a lot of, um, well, for us, you know, adjustment support and, and, and market conditions support. Uh, and, and what we need to do is realize that um, w- there we can only pull apart that data so far because um, because we can only know so much. Mm-hmm. And so that that's really the the limitation. You, there's no single set of data out there that you can apply any sort of technique to that's going to explain human behavior. It's too much. Yeah. Really interesting. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. My uh, my daughter's uh, boyfriend uh, just graduated from the University of Norway uh, with his doctoral, um, and I'm I don't remember the exact title, but it was in statistics, right? It's in data science, uh, and and he's going to spend his life doing data science, right? He he uh, currently is employed uh, in a cancer research research institute and and studying the data out there, the medical data, right? That on one end is is amazing, first of all, uh, way above my head, second of all, um, but 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 fascinating, right? But when you're dealing with medical science, it's one thing. When you're dealing with human behavior, right, on, on, on the scale of what we're talking about, green shutters, for example, um, talk to us a little bit about why that's different and, and not knowing a lot about, of course, what he, what he, what, what my, my, uh, my daughter's boyfriend does. But talk to us a little bit about what the difference is between, say, medical data and, and human behavior data, which is really what we're dealing with here with real estate? Um, Well, I'm not going to speak to the medical data thing because there, (laughs) anytime you, um, okay, anytime you have a a different, okay, data is not all equal. Okay. So, um, and data science and the reason you can get a doctorate in data science is because there's a whole lot there and there's a whole lot of different types of data and ways to collect it. And um, you know different things that you can get out of it. What what we're doing is we're looking at a closed sale, mm-hmm. and we've got some information about that closed sale. And um, so that data is, I think, what I would term messy. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of variables, and so uh, whenever you you try to isolate. Okay. So you try to isolate a variable. That's what you do in order to, to study it. Well, it becomes very hard to isolate a variable in real estate. And when you, when you try, you need to, to be careful not to, not to say, okay, I have proven this. You can never prove an adjustment. Um, What you can do is you can, in, in my, my way of looking at it, you can create a model for an adjustment that explains the human behavior and that you can um, compare to a set of data and say, okay, this model that explains this human behavior, it does a pretty good job of explaining this data as well. Hmm. Um, and when when all those fit together, that supports an adjustment really well, but of course it can never prove it because you can't you can't prove human behavior it's it's too too complicated but you can sure do a good job of supporting it when you use all the available tools just this morning on my all-star team private facebook page somebody asked a question about a certain circumstance that they were dealing with and that's a great page for you know we got hundreds of appraisers across the nation who are there to help each other right and so you know it's a it's an easy thing to to ask a question there you're not going to get attacked you're not going to say well that's stupid um but i cringed a little bit with this with this question because she had described a situation that she had that was very unusual for the market and she said i've got a sale that that proves that this adjustment was was correct using the word prove right and so we you know gently um educated uh, corrected and and looked into it but but i'm glad you brought that up because i think sometimes as we started the program today, we talked about big data, right? And sometimes appraisers fear big data uh, because of the UAD, because of the unknown, because, hey, is this going to take over my job kind of a thing, right? But if we can allow ourselves to embrace big data and understand the more information you have, the better, usually, right? The more data that you have, the better. That taking one sale and saying, okay, this adjustment is proven because sale number seven proves that everything I did on sales one through six is quote unquote accurate, right? 
Uh, you see where I'm going with this. So I absolutely <laughs> see where you're going. So what I what I want to end on, uh, Brent, is is I think more and more appraisers are waking up. I know I am right to this to this idea that we need to be better. Right. The old school ways of throwing three comps in there, licking our fingers, sticking it in the air, adjusting, you know, what we thought was the was the correct adjustment, right? And then turning that appraisal in and just hoping and praying it doesn't come back for a revision or God forbid a, a state board investigation, right? Uh, those days are over. Like we as appraisers, if we are going to be quote unquote professionals, we need to look at this data, the new information, the more information that we have that's available to us and start to formulate what that looks like. I know you've got a class on this. T talk to us a little bit about that. If appraisers want to better support their adjustments, what can you do to help them? Okay, so yeah, I, I just started teaching a class called Creating Formulas That Work. And what we do in the class is we sort of go down the road that, that you and I have gone down in this conversation um, to, to talk about how to see data differently, how to um, to rethink what we do. And, and then what I what I work them toward is is a model how I how I describe this as a model I actually give them a, a template which is a model for um, uh, for adjustment support and what we do is we look at uh, so many of the things that influence why people behave the way that they do and use those as, variables that feed this model. It sounds super complicated, um, but what I try to do is is make it um, uh, make it really accessible by giving all the students what I've already done. Mm -hmm. So um, instead of just teaching somebody how to do it, I say, okay, I've spent a lot of years creating this giant Excel workbook. Um, and what I've done is I've taken myself out of it Hmm. And show and I explain how to put each appraiser into it. Okay, this is a um, a framework. It's a it's a model that it, that incorporates a whole lot of of common variables. Here's how to insert yourself into it. How, how to take your experience, your research, put it into the model so that uh, instead of starting from scratch every appraisal, okay, I've got to support this adjustment. You already know how to support that adjustment. You've done it a thousand times. Don't throw away the thousand times that you've already done it. Figure out how to have those thousand times pull forward and support your adjustment now. Hmm. And modeling is a way to do that. And, and it's and it's not as complicated as you might think. Love it. I, I love uncomplicated. I'm an uncomplicated man. I love uncomplicated. Brent. How do people get a hold of you if they're interested in your class or 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 just you know chatting with you and and, and getting more information? Uh, what's the best way to to reach you? Okay, well, uh, email always works. Uh, Brent at txvaluepro.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn quite a bit. Uh, the class is through Appraiser eLearning, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, I'm I'm easy to get to. Uh, I had my my first class just uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and I reached out to every student personally and just you know, tried to try to make contact. And, you know, how how that go for you? I, I want you to actually use this. Um, so I'm definitely not throwing something out there and stepping back and see what happens. Love I it. actually I actually want want us to start working together so that our profession can can make the difficult transitions that are coming our way and that we're already living through right now. So, um, so I, I think we're going to have to to pull together in order to, to do that. I agree, my friend. I, I love the direction that the industry is going. Uh, grateful for people like you uh, helping to move that needle. Brent Bowen, uh, Texas Valuation Professionals. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. You've been listening to the Appraiser Coach Podcast with Dustin Harris. If you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating and post a short review on iTunes. For more in-depth insider information on how you can make more money as a real estate appraiser, visit theappraisercoach.com and sign up for the All-Star Team today. Thanks for joining us. And now, get out there and create some value.